So in this video, I want to continue talking about light and the sun is just, sorry, over here, really cooperating, uh, sending down these beautiful light rays for our video. So in the last video, we understood that light is a particular kind of electromagnetic phenomenon and the light is actually a certain kind of oscillating electric and magnetic field with a pattern that I've shown in this picture here. So the idea here is that if you looked at the light from say a flashlight and you froze time for a moment and then along a certain line, if you looked at the electric field at all the points on that line and the magnetic field on all the points at that line, then they would look like this. So they'd have this pattern. And if you looked at those fields along another line, it would have this pattern and similarly like that. And so we notice this characteristic wave pattern where depending on where you are, the electric field might point um, up or down. Let's pretend the orange here is the electric field and the blue is the magnetic field. So the electric field points up here and down here and then up here and down there. And the length or the, the magnitude of this electric field as a function of position along this line, it has this characteristic wave pattern. Okay, so this would be a particular example of a light wave. And so because it is a wave it has pretty much the same properties as any other wave. So we can identify an amplitude. How big does the electric field get at the largest point? We can identify a wave speed. So if I let that propagate um, with time, then everything, the whole pattern moves to the right at a certain speed that was three times 10 to the eight meters per second, assuming that it's moving through empty space. We can identify a wavelength, so that would again be in this snapshot picture. How far is it between the places where the electric field is maximum and the next place where the electric field is maximum? And we can identify a frequency, which is re again related to the wavelength and the velocity in the same way as for sound waves. So what the frequency of a light wave would mean is that if you were to look at one particular location and look at how quickly is the electric field going up and down, then that would be what we mean by the frequency of an electromagnetic wave. So it's interesting now to think about if we have various sources of light, what are the basic properties that distinguish those? So light from the sun or light from a light bulb or light from your phone screen. What are the different ways that you would characterize that light? And how are those qualitative properties of light related to these mathematical wave properties that I just talked about? So maybe take a moment to think about that, pause the video, and then we're going to discuss it. Okay, well, Probably the most basic property that distinguishes different sources of light would be how bright is the light. So obviously the light that we see from the sun is far, far brighter than the light from a light bulb or the light from stars or the moon. And so that's very much like the intensity property of the sound waves or the, the loudness property of the sound waves. And so you might guess that like the loudness of sound was related to the amplitude of the sound wave. Similarly, the brightness of light is related to most directly to the amplitude of the electromagnetic wave. So brighter light is going to have a larger amplitude of the oscillation of that electric field. The next thing we could talk about is the property that we perceive as the color of the light. And so the simplest thing is just to talk about light that has one particular wavelength. Okay, so I should say that most light is gonna be a combination of different wavelengths. It won't be exactly this simple pattern, 
Like with sound, you have the superposition principle at play, and so you could have multiple waves on top of each other. But for our discussion, it's simplest to start by imagining that we're just talking about light with one specific wavelength. And so light with one specific wavelength is going to be perceived as having a particular color, and that color is going to depend on which wavelength we choose. So the difference between red light and blue light of the same brightness is mostly the wavelength of that light. So if you look at the wavelengths of the light, they're pretty small for light that's red. It's about 0 0.0007 millimeters. And if you look at light that is violet, that is 0 0.0004 millimeters. And the other colors have wavelengths, the other colors that you see in a rainbow have wavelengths that are somewhere in between those two. If we use our formula that frequency equals velocity over wavelength, to calculate the frequencies of these light waves, then what you find is that they're kind of enormous. So the frequency of red light is 400 trillion hertz. So that's 400 million million times per second that the electric field goes up and down in a beam of red light. And with violet light, it's 700 trillion or 700 million million times per second that the electric field goes up and down. So one of the interesting things that you'll notice is that this is actually a relatively small range of kind of very specific frequencies or very specific wavelengths that we associate with light. So you notice that even if you take the red light, which has the lowest wavelength, if you double or lowest frequency, if you doubled that frequency, um, that frequency is no longer a frequency of light that we can see. Okay, so just like sound had a particular range of frequencies that we could hear from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, light has a particular range of frequencies that we can see, and it's actually much narrower. Okay, so it's actually, in terms of musical terminology, it's less than a full octave of of light if you want. So double the frequency from the lowest frequency and you're already at a frequency that you can't see anymore. But as you might think and as Maxwell was the first to realize, there can in fact be lots of different possible electromagnetic waves that have wavelengths that are shorter or longer than this range of wavelengths that correspond to visible light. So just like for sound, you can have much higher frequencies, and we use these in ultrasound machines, and you can have lower frequencies that we can't hear. For light, you can have frequencies that are whatever you want and wavelengths that are whatever you want. There's no theoretical limit to upper limit or lower limit to the wavelength for electromagnetic radiation. And so now we're pretty much familiar with these other types of electromagnetic radiation. So if you go down in frequency, so to longer wavelengths, then you get infrared radiation, and longer than that, you have microwaves, and so those are the, those are the kinds of electromagnetic waves that cell phones use to communicate or, or Wi-Fi uses. Uh, then at longer frequencies, or sorry, at uh, lower frequencies or longer wavelengths, you get radio waves, so your AM and your FM radio, uh, use those kinds of waves to communicate. And then going up in frequency from the frequencies of visible light, you get to ultraviolet, you get to x-rays, and then you get to gamma rays, which, which um, usually are produced by certain forms of radioactivity. So you can see that we can really see only a small fraction of the possible wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation. But the other ones definitely exist. All right, so now I want to focus on this visible light and kind of get back to something that I mentioned earlier, which is that a general source of light is not just going to have one particular wavelength. It's going to be a combination of light with many different wavelengths. So just, to, just like a general sound, 
you can represent as a combination of pure tones, which are very special sounds that correspond to sound waves with sinusoidal patterns and particular frequencies. Okay, any, any light we could think of as a combination of what we call monochromatic waves. So those are the light versions of the pure tones. These are sinusoidal light waves with specific wavelengths. So the way that we represent general combinations of these waves is the same as the one that we use for sound waves. So this is the idea of a spectrum. We can make a graph like this where you show the wavelength and you, or the frequency, whatever you want. And then you show on the y-axis the amplitude of your wave at that frequency or the intensity if you want, how much uh, energy there is in your light at that particular wavelength or that particular frequency. Okay. So the interpretation of these spectrum graphs for light is very much the same as the interpretation of the spectrum graphs for sound. So a graph like this would show you the general combination of waves that make up a particular light source. Now for the light, there's actually a convenient way to understand which frequencies or which wavelengths are there. And that is using a prism or other similar technologies. So this is a very simple idea that you just have a particular shaped piece of glass or other transparent material. And then when you shine your light, a beam of your light from whatever source on the prism, then when it goes through into the glass, the light actually bends. It goes through a process that we call refraction. And depending on the wavelength, it bends more or less. So once it comes out the other side of the prism, it turns out that now the light with one wavelength is going in one direction and the light with another wavelength is going in a different direction. And so you can actually see all of the different specific wavelengths of light getting split up into, into this rainbow that we're familiar with. Okay. So you could take sunlight or you could take light from any other source and you could split it up like this and you could see how much is there at different wavelengths and that way you could figure out what the spectrum of the light looks like. So here's just a couple of examples of light spectra. So in this top one, I've shown the spectrum of sunlight. And so you notice, so this is sunlight at the surface of the earth and so you notice that there's a lot of it that isn't visible. And we're basically familiar with that. We know that there's ultraviolet radiation from the sun that can give you a sunburn, but we can't see it. And there's also infrared radiation from the sun. It's, it's what makes the sunlight feel warm on your skin. Okay, so and there, there are a lot of objects that are not giving off any light, but they still feel warm. And that's because they're producing this infrared radiation that is then hitting your skin if you bring your hand close to it. So this is the spectrum of sunlight. We see the visible portion of that light is, is uh, just a part of it. And down below, I've given another example, and this is the spectrum from a particular kind of light bulb, so a compact fluorescent bulb. And this one is particularly interesting because you notice it has like these sharp peaks. So if these were sound spectra, then the sunlight would be like the spectrum from some noise, whereas this compact fluorescent bulb spectrum, that would be like the spectrum from a musical instrument. And so we're going to get back to that and answer the question of why something like a compact fluorescent bulb has a musical spectrum like that. Okay, but I'm going to set that aside until a future lecture. Okay. So in the next video, we're then going to talk about how we actually perceive this light. We're going to talk about our sense of vision. And we'll see that even though the way that we represent the information about a sound wave and about a light wave, it's mathematically identical. So up until now, you can have you know, light waves, you could have any spectrum you want, you could have sound waves, you can have any spectrum you want. So the information is very, very similar, but the way that we perceive it, the amount of information that we actually get about these spectra is very, very different when you talk about sound um, hearing versus when you talk about light.